either out of wisdom or folly today, we'll see in about 20 minutes, I'm going to take on the subject of free will, which I think is absolute madness, but I've had these interesting thoughts that seem relevant. Um, so we'll try it. You all can vote at the end. <laughs> um, the subject today is whether man can see God or not, so the question is actually, who are we? That's, what that, that's where this, all this thinking comes from. Because if we, as we are, can see God, I mean, if we, in the consciousness that we have, can realize God, but we think of ourselves, man representing both man and woman, um, we think of ourselves in a certain way, and that is not, a, not able to actually realize God. What is it in us that is actually able to do this? And this really is the whole question of the spiritual path, which is, who are we? What am I? Where do I come from? In our Festival of Light, we say that every week. Who am I? What, what is real? What is lasting truth? That's the, the question that we have to answer. Now, how this relates to the question of free will uh, is the, um, the thought that we all have in our minds that I want to be able to do what I feel to do. And we get very anxious when Swamiji or anyone starts talking about the law of karma. And when the masters start talking about the law of karma, and all of you know it to a certain extent, law of karma is cause and effect in human life. The force that we set in motion that then becomes the track that we're walking on and causes things to happen. We want to think that at some point we're making our own decisions. It, it, um, it's fundamental to our sense of ourselves, isn't it? We don't like the idea that somehow we're just born into the system and we're like uh, in those, one of those rides in Disneyland where you think you're running the car or you're driving the boat, but in fact underneath it you're just on this track and you get to turn this wheel back and forth, but you're just going to go like that no matter what. You know, it's just, um, it's frustrating. Swamiji always tells the story of he took this from Italy and the father of the family of this Italian family who'd always used to being in charge got his family into one of those little boats and Swamiji was in his boat and there he was trying gaily to wave at him but the man couldn't take his hands off the wheel because he was very concerned he had his family out on this boat you know and only later were they able to tease him about how foolish we all are now Swamiji has actually stated that the law of cause and effect is so exact and he was uh, Dr. Peter in Ananda village who uh, always dresses up a little more because he runs this medical clinic and he w would often wear very nice ties. Um, so Amiji said like, for example, when you went into your closet this morning and you looked at your array of ties and decided which one to pick, there was really only one that you could have picked. I mean, that's so annoying, isn't it? <laughs> Especially when you spend so much time, you know, thinking about the whole thing. So the obvious other thought that we have is, well, what the heck? Why should I do anything? And we just become very passive. But you can tell by the fruits that when you see, and in the Bible, Jesus is asked, how can you tell a true prophet from a false one? And Jesus answers, by their fruits, ye shall know them. That a good tree gives good fruit, and a bad tree gives bad fruit. And that's how you can tell whether the prophet is true or false. That's actually a principle that can pretty much be applied to everything. How can you tell whether an action is right or not? Well, eventually, that action will bear fruit. And you can tell by the fruit whether or not it was a good idea. The difficulty with this is that that also requires reincarnation to make it work. Because sometimes the fruit doesn't quite, you know, it takes time for the fruit to come out. We have a fig tree in front of our house where we live in the community, and right now it's just nothing but bare sticks. I mean, it's a huge fig tree that's filled with figs in the summer, but right now there's nothing on it. You wouldn't even know it was a fig tree unless you, unless you were knowledgeable already, but it will go through this cycle and then it will bear fruit. And so our own actions, so when I say, sometimes if we think, well, there's no, I have no real choices, why should I do anything? But if you see people who have given up, in essence, because that's what it's about. If you see people who have not transcended the necessity to be in charge, but have actually abdicated the necessity to be in charge, and just are drifting through life, and not putting out any energy, the, 
there's no magnetism. You don't see joy. You don't see anything that attracts you. It, it's not a person that you would want to be. And that's one of the simple ways we know. We look around. We see those persons uh, who, who we would like to be, th- those who represent the ideal to us. And we ask ourselves, how have they lived? You know, that's why the avatars come. That's why the saints and the masters come, because then they live out this human life with us, but they show us by their right actions what's possible in terms of dynamism and refinement and sensitivity and above all, love and joy. So you see someone like Paramahansa Yogananda, or we have had the opportunity to see Kriyananda, who's extremely hardworking, very ambitious for his guru's sake, extremely determined in what he does and perseveres against all obstacles. And then you think, well, who is who? What is what in all of this? Well, I was thinking driving in the car this morning. Um, We drive from the community here every week and David is driving and I'm riding in the car and we're just going along like this. And there's a lot of other cars driving around us. And we sort of see them, and we have to have some relationship to those cars, because if we didn't, um, we could easily get ourselves in trouble. You have to be wide awake and know what's happening. But they just flow. They have our own rea- their own reality. They whiz past you, and you may have a sort of fleeting sense of whoever might be in that car, but you don't translate. Or we don't transfer our sense of identity into any of those cars. They're just forces that move around us. We have responsibility for this one, and we sort of come down the road. Sometimes, even though I'm not driving, I'll press on the ground or look like that response because that's where we are. Well, in our human lives, we live in one body, and we move that body around, and we're inside of it, And we see all the other bodies going by us, and we have a certain sense of relationship to them, but they just move in their own way. This is the one that we're responsible for. And just as on the freeway, you have to remain responsible for your car, so as we move through this life, you have to retain responsibility for the one that you're you're driving, that you're responsible for. But the question is, what does it mean to be a good driver? And how do we really negotiate, navigate through all the events that we're dealing with? Now, we think, the ego mind thinks, that the responsibility we have is for all the external things that we're doing. Where do I live? Who do I marry? What, you know, whether or not I have children. What does my house look like? How do I wear my hair? What do I put on my car today? And we think that's the point at which free choice is exercised. But the actual reality of it is, it's about the consciousness we have while we move through with this car here. Because the car itself, meaning our body and our personality, and in a sense our karmic destiny, we really are on a track. We're really on a Disneyland track. And it's just going to go where it's going to go. Now, not because there's somebody arbitrarily moving the pieces, but because we ourselves have set in motion so many causes that each one will lead to the next one. Uh, a, A Buddhist woman teacher was talking about the law of karma and how her, she always rebelled against it the same basic principle. She didn't like this idea that everything was somehow pushed upon her. But she said she was cuddling her grandson and her grandson sneezed in her face. You know, anybody who deals with little children knows how children are just little germ machines and they just spread those germ machines all over the place. So her grandson sneezed in her face and in due course she came down with the appropriate cold Because she had that cold, she wasn't able to to fulfill a certain professional obligation she had, which had certain implications, and all of these things happened. And she started thinking about the law of karma in relation to that. She started thinking about holding her grandson and the fact that the grandson sneezed in her face. She thought, well, what brought her to the point with her grandson? Well, of course, prior to that, she must have had a son herself 
because if she hadn't had a son, there would be no grandson. And if she, the only way she could have a son in her life was that if she had met her husband. And the only way she could have met her husband is if she had gone to a certain college. The only way she could go to that certain college is because she was raised in a certain family. And the reason she was raised in a certain family because her parents, her grandparents, and she just couldn't find the point where it stopped. No matter how far back you went, she couldn't find a point where she could draw a circle around any decision that she made all by herself. You know, and annoying as that was to her, she had to see that it's just an interwoven tapestry. One thread leads to another, to another, to another, to another. Now, instead of making that us feel just sort of helpless and defeated, what we have to actually ask is, what is the right use of our willpower? And what does it mean to be free? Now, Swamiji often explains this in very simple words. And I've been listening to Swami Kriyananda t teach since 1969, was when I first met him. And I've heard him say many of the same things because it's not like the ancient eternal teachings have shifted in these years. And so he'll often say, and he has new ideas and new ways of expressing, but it's the same basic ideas. And I've heard him say many times that we think our free will is to do what we want. But if we're doing what we want, we're being compelled by our desire to do it. And how does that make us free? Do you see? I mean, when, when you're sitting in your house, I'll use, I'll use more personal, when I'm sitting my, in my house, aware of the fact that in the freezer is a bag of cookies, <laughs> that I made myself chocolate chip cookies. They're really, really good. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, you know, how many more cookies can I eat before I have to get a new wardrobe? I start thinking about the expense of the wardrobe, and then I think about those cookies. And pretty soon, I'm having just one. You know? Now, was that a free choice? I mean, where is the freedom in that, me and that cookie? I certainly don't feel free. And what if, oh, let's say my perfect husband, just slips a little and says something that wounds my sensitive heart. And he doesn't mean ill by it. I know he doesn't, but I, my feelings are hurt. And I want to remember 29 years of wonderful life. You know, I read in that book, um, the Mars and Venus book, Wim Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. I'm going to just digress because I love this. I just skimmed through that book, and little parts of it are great. It said one of the things they talk about is how men and women keep score differently. It's my favorite part of that book. Men naturally think that, for example, if they've worked their whole lives and have bought a beautiful home that the wife loves, that that's worth, let's say, 500 points, maybe 1,000, maybe even 1,500 points. And if he sent the kids to school and he's been absolutely faithful to her for all these years, I mean, he has, like, points to spare. So when Valentine's Day comes or his anniversary and he misses it, he figures, you know, it just hardly makes a dent. Women score everything as one. <laughs> the house is one, the college education is one, you know, fidelity is one, Valentine's Day is one. <laughs> so everything, he thinks he's doing fine, one tiny little slip, it's over as far as she's concerned. I mean, I watched myself do this in the early years of my marriage. You know, I watched myself do it, like the magnitude of response. So anyway, so let's just pretend when I was younger, some little thing would happen and I would take it all so seriously and I would say to myself, this is crazy. You know, why are you feeling like this? Just suck down the rabbit hole. Is that freedom? And then I would express myself, you know. Oh my God. Is that freedom? Is that free will? You know, free will is the ability to do what is good for you. That's what free will really is, and that's what we have to cultivate. That's the opportunity we have, is to come to the point where spontaneously and naturally, without any hesitation, 
we do that which is happiness producing. And everything else we are compelled to do. We are compelled by desire. And often that desire is, oh, unspeakably misguided. But that doesn't mean we still don't want to do it. We want, because we're all confused. We are not free. And the freedom, real freedom, and the, the scriptures speak of it as the love of God. Once you experience the love of God, you don't want anything else. The word Hari, which is used in our Gita reading today, Hari is such a sweet phrase, sweet word. It means, it's a word that means God, translates in English, but the subtlety of it is much more than that. It means the stealer of hearts. And Krishna was known as Hari because they have all these beautiful stories of how as a, a beautiful young man, he lived in Brindaban and all of the gopis, all of the ladies of the village were madly in love with Krishna. And we think of that as romantic or sexual or something like that. None of that. He just took their hearts. And they have these beautiful stories of how they'd be in the middle of fixing dinner and they would hear the call of the flute. And they would just walk out of their homes and just meet Krishna in the uh, middle of the forest and they would dance together because he had totally stolen their heart. Now, what steals our heart is the experience of joy, isn't it? We may first call that love, but what the power of love is, is the power of joy. That which gives us bliss is what we really want to do. Now, that cookie in my mind can form this little picture of bliss but it's not really bliss, it's a pleasure to eat it. You know, it, it tastes good, I made it myself, I know it's good, like that. But there's no lasting bliss in that cookie. After you finish eating it, you think, oh, why did I do that? I mean, if it's something you don't really want to do, and sometimes we do, whoa, really horrible things. Make really bad decisions, express really unuseful feelings and comments, make, just do really, you know, we all do, let's forget that, let's not go there, you know. It's not in our best interest. It doesn't bring us bliss. And, but but the, the reason Hari steals our hearts is because that feeling of being in harmony with, a, with an eternal, lasting reality, nobody has to force you then to choose that. And we find that out ourselves. We, the, the, the feelings, the the bad action, so to speak, the wrong actions that we're no longer attracted to doing, we're no longer attracted to them because they, we can tell that it's not going to make us happy. You know, I know some people have had to go through addictions to certain reality, you know, addictions to substances, addictions to alcohol, have to work your way through from the thought that that was going to make me happy to the very, very deep, unshakable realization that it is not going to make me happy. And even if sometimes the thought comes back to your mind, you still know, I remember that one. Others of us are born without having to deal with that particular thing, just knowing it, maybe touching into it a little bit, just touching it a little bit and finding our, our minds getting changed and scrambled and realizing, oh, that's not pleasurable for me. And others are just born just no interest, and the reason we have no interest is really scary when you think about it, Master says, is because we've tried it. The reason it takes us so long while we have to incarnate so many times is because we've tried it. We've tested it out to the absolute end and it's just not going to please us. It's not going to give us bliss. Because once that bliss of living in attunement with our own selves, really, we personify it as the infinite. But what the infinite is giving us is a taste of our own higher reality. Yogananda describes in that uh, incident of ex it perceiving all of creation as this movement of light forming and reforming. And then he realized that the origin point of that was a point of intuitive perception in his own heart. There's so many phrases in autobiography of a yogi that if that's all we had, a point of intuitive perception in our own heart, this entire universe is nothing but oscillating waves of light that emanate from our own selves. 
And that's the love of God in our hearts. That's the bliss of God in our own hearts. It's the origin point of everything. And the only freedom we have is to live in that bliss or to reject that bliss. And everything else is just cars moving down the freeway. They don't really have anything to do with us. We think that the events of our own life, this was another one of Master's magnificent phrases, people make the mistake of thinking that everything that happens to them concerns them personally. And, and the first time I heard that, it was just like my brain went off like this, being just completely involved in my own reality. How could it not concern me? But the more we move back from those oscillating waves of light, which is our own personality is nothing but that. And you see, that's why this so-called freedom just isn't there. It's just oscillating waves of light. We're just riding these waves of light. We're just destined by all the momentum we've set in motion in the past to go to the closet and choose that dress. But at the same time, how we experience that ride down the predetermined highway, that's our free will. Is this going to be a nightmare of just ever repeating karmic events that just keep throwing us into a state of total confusion? Are we going to live in the middle of it, attuned to that point of intuitive perception that just realizes that this is just oscillating light? That's our freedom. Now, yes, you can start arguing with me that whether or not we do that is also predetermined. Yes, it's true. But let's decide that it's predetermined that a little bit of effort in our part will keep us right on that spot. Now, once we start living right on that spot, and here is an interesting point about free will and karma, that Master says, for the devotee, the karmic law does not always apply. Because the Master's have complete control over this. And the only reason we have to keep experiencing the consequences of our behavior is to teach us that the most desirable reality is to stay in tune with that point of intuitive perception. And once we have gotten on the spiritual path and are using our God-given energy and free will to keep ourselves in that light, the master literally intervenes. And the karma is, is coming at you, but he inserts his consciousness between you and the blow. And so there may be a little bit of a shock wave, but the whole force won't hit you. I was out in the rain yesterday, and my sister had an umbrella. I did not. She had an umbrella, and therefore, she didn't get as wet as I did. Right? The master is like an umbrella. I was talking to a friend of mine at Ananda Village earlier this week, and we were just talking about moments in time. She told me this, this extraordinary story. She and her husband have always had a great affection for coffee, good coffee. They like really good coffee. They've sent us over the years many really fine brands of coffee. He applies his intelligence to finding excellent coffee. God uses us, uses our weaknesses and uses our own characteristics. Well, she and her husband and a friend of theirs, they lived in Los Angeles then. They now live at Ananda Village. They'd driven up to Ananda Village and had taken Kriya Yoga initiation, a great spiritual event. And they were on their way back home. And they were speeding down the highway. He was in the far left lane. He was going very, very fast, you know, perhaps even faster than the speed limit. I don't know. He was going fast on the freeway. His wife suddenly says to him, let's have coffee, just out of nothing. He says, sure. Their passenger says, sure. Boom, he moves right over, just womb like that. Moves right over, gets right off the exit lane, just as they're, they're off the off-ramp, just starting to turn under this uh, street, transmission in their car totally freezes and goes out. Just like that. And the car stops dead like that. Imagine if they had been in that far left lane going just when that happened. The force was there. It was going to happen. But the guru says, how about some coffee? <laughs> and of course, he has to use our own reasoning. <laughs> but what do you do with stories like that? You know, that, that, that's what our freedom is. And it didn't come in the moment because they loved coffee. 
It came because they had brought themselves to the point of having Kriya initiation and uh, uh, brought themselves to the point where, okay, all this karma is still going to have to run out, all these other cars, all my life is going to have to happen all around me. I'm going to be inclined to do this and inclined to do that and need to do this and have to do that. But in the middle of it, there's only one reality for me. It's, it, it's, so, it's so magnificent once you really begin to understand that. Because then you don't, you don't sweat the small stuff anymore. Like whether you're married and have children or, you know, nothing like that. Your, your career, where you live, where you spend your time. All of it becomes the small stuff compared to one simple reality. Do I keep my consciousness centered on the source of all that oscillating light, or do I not? Now, it takes great will, and it takes great courage to constantly be willing, once all of these things happen and we find ourselves swept away again, to just bring your energy back. I recall talking to a friend of mine who was talking about trying to understand how to live by God's will. I said, you have to use all the energy that you would use to try to make things happen in an egoic way to hold yourself absolutely still at the center point until you can feel the source of that light moving you. And that's why Swami Kriyananda, and he's been saying it a lot lately in his life, he says, the reason I've been able to do so much in my life is because I've never done anything at all. And of course, I've seen him work until literally, almost, almost literally to the point of death. You know, fighting against heart problems and all these things and refusing to quit. I mean, the man has appeared to do a lot. But all of that action has happened from the center point of the origin of the oscillating light, that still center around which everything else swirls living in that, then you say, oh yes, a lot has happened. But I, the infinite spirit, have done nothing at all except live in the eternal now. Isn't that an extraordinary promise? Isn't that worth the effort? All the saints promise it, and your own experience will confirm it if we but give ourselves and allow Hari to steal our hearts. Don't hide it away, but put it out right out in front so Hari can just come and grab it and then you can belong to him. God bless you.